Hello, Davy. Welcome. I think you are a mute. That must be the most common phrase in the whole pandemic thing. There we go. Uh, yes, awesome. I was on mute. I, yes, and you are right. It is the <laughs> probably the most common phrase in the world at the moment. Yeah. Awesome. Would you like to introduce yourself briefly before we go to your presentation? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name's Dave, Dave West. I'm here in uh, in just outside Boston in the United States of America, though you can tell from my accent for the people that are uh, that, that, that know things about accents. I'm actually British, uh, but uh, I'm an immigrant here to, to America. I came here 20 years ago for the people that are um, that have some challenges from sight for the blind, uh, etc. I am a tall, bald Englishman uh, who supports a football team called uh, Leicester City. Um, not sure that's necessary for, for anybody that, that can't see, but I thought I'd share that anyway, because I hear that football's kind of big in Brazil, right? <laughs> yes, it is. It is. So let's jump to our presentation then. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about value and how increasing the value of velocity is actually the most important single thing that we can be doing. Now, this presentation was inspired by the recent changes to the Scrum Guide. Now, the Scrum Guide, um, uh, for some of you that use Scrum, was changed in November. And because of some of those changes, there was a lot of interesting discussions about the change in focus. And value was one of those topics. And so during the presentation, you'll hear more about that. But this was inspired because a lot of people are using Agile and Scrum to do work, which is great. But ultimately, the value, not to overuse that term, of Scrum and Agile is to deliver value for customers, to change outcomes, and to improve everything for everybody. So let's get into it. Um, before we start, perhaps you'd want to know who I am. My name is Dave West, as I said earlier. I'm the CEO of uh, an organization called Scrum, scrum.org, and um, the chairman uh, of the organization, the founder of the organization, was the co-creator of Scrum, Ken Schwaber. Actually, I was on a call with him yesterday, and um, so he's still around, very heavily to asking me how we're doing. As you can imagine, the sprint reviews, when you invite Ken Schwaber to them, are not as much fun as you imagine. He can ask some really insightful questions and also questions how we're actually working. So uh, that's interesting. Scrum.org is in the thought leadership training certification and um, continuing education sort of business, really focused not on Scrum, but on the mission of Scrum which is to help people and teams solve complex problems. So, so let's, let's start talking about the place that we're in at the moment. So, um, and as an economist that I like particularly, you'll see her book here, uh, Kalida Perez. She's uh, Venezuelan, but she uh, works in London. And she writes about the changing of ages from the industrial revolution through steam, through steel, through mass production, and now we're in another age. Um, she doesn't call it the age of software. Uh, it's me, my license. But she ultimately is talking about this new technology age. The reason why that's so important is because as we move through these ages from this, we have historically always changed our mindset and our approach to work. And the systems around work have changed. We remember when, you know, Henry Ford came along and created this mass production model. We remember when um, the, uh, we had this progressive era that, and London, right, at the age of steel, when they learned how to mass produce steel and they learned how to make big ships and the Titanic and all those sort of mass things and obviously the steam engines. These, these ages have changed the way society operates and the way people have worked. The reason why I bring it up is because I believe, obviously, I, I feel very sorry for what's happening in Brazil at the moment and throughout the world. It's devastating. And, and I'm sorry if any of you are affected by this. But COVID really has actually triggered, particularly in the US, but I believe throughout the world, this inflection point 
where we literally are going to move from a very quickly move from the age of oil and mass production to this digital age. And we'll go into what Kalida Perez talks about is the deployment age of, of this, this of these technologies, which has huge ramifications for society around it. These ramifications are perhaps best described as these changes. The planning horizon model changes. I don't know about you, but over the last year, my ability to plan a year, I can't even plan a vacation that's six months out, let alone decide where we're gonna invest stuff. We've seen a subtle change in organizations where they've now moving more to a continuous flow kind of model of delivery and of value delivery, which is being characterized as a movement from projects to product. Now at the heart of that is this customer alignment. So we're seeing the organizations that actually manage to deal very quickly with the impact of COVID into how they worked. The most successful ones were the ones where, that were aligned to customers, interestingly, not to processes and systems. And what that meant was they rapidly, as the customer's needs changed and that their organization could respond to it, as opposed to having some translation between those changes into the systems and processes around it. The abundance mindset is everywhere now. And the fact that I have a website that over a million people go to every month, and it's running on Amazon AWS, costs me a couple of thousand dollars a month to run it. And ultimately, we have the ability to do anything. I mean, you've seen that with the vaccines, particularly the Pfizer and the Moderna, that they built a vaccine using RNA in months which is incredible. Now, the ability to mass produce it and deliver it to people, that's a little bit more of a complex problem maybe. But it's incredible the world that we live in, in regard to our ability to innovate and to deploy technology to solve problems. Cross-functional teams versus specialist teams, process control versus self-organization, self-management. And I think there's been a change, and we're seeing this in America. There's an interesting study that McKinsey did during COVID where they looked at the seven levels of management and looked at the, the communication between those, how it was before and how it was after the impact of COVID. And they found that middle level managers were communicating less with anybody and that the senior managers, the level six and sevens, were communicating more with the ones, twos, and threes than they'd ever done before. Because in times of crisis, in times of massive change, you can't afford for this sort of like game of telephone as you collaborate through, through the organization. So you have to go directly. It's a bit like when you get a, a problem with a system and you call everybody into the war room and you get everybody there, including the executives. You have to recall a drug or you have to deliver a new product to market because something goes wrong. You build these very agile, very empowered, very directed teams. And that's the world that we're moving to, which has huge implications on change cycles. Particularly, you know, we're living in the right now, things changing continuously. Can we travel? Can we not travel? Can people go into the office? Can they not? We're locked down, we're not locked down. They're obviously very direct examples of that, but the subtler ones like how consumers are buying things, how they can, you know, that now people have a lot more flexibility to buy on the internet. Actually, Amazon, though they are ultimately the most successful organization for that in the US, are slowly seeing their market change because people now are actually appreciating that other organizations can provide the same service and the same level of response. So if we live in that way, world, we need to realign around customers we need to deliver frequently and be agile because everything will change. That's, that's quite obvious. So delivering value to customers is our number one priority. Hang on, does that sound a little familiar? Remember the Agile Manifesto? When we looked at the principles, delivering fr incrementally frequently to customers was one of those principles. So that's great. Obviously, we've been doing that, haven't we? That's what we've done every day. 
Well, maybe. What we see over and over again when we go to organizations, when we talk about at the highest level, we talk about delivering customer value incrementally, this product being some definition of the, of the outcomes that we seek, some bounded customer definition of the, of the, of the outcomes that we seek. We talk about it, the increment, incremental change to this, delivering value, inspecting and adapting that and feeding it back. Everybody goes, yes, Dave. It's exactly what we we're doing. In fact, part of this talk was inspired by a trip to Brazil 18 months ago, as in São Paulo. Uh, fantastic, by the way. I, but though I gained about 20 pounds, I'm not sure what that is in Brazil. I was like, no, it can't be. It must be some must be some jet lag thing. But uh, the food was a little insane, and I, yeah, I sort of fell in love with uh, with the food. But anyway, as I was in uh, Brazil, I decided because of the distance from Boston and the time zones and all that, I wanted to go for a week. And I visited with a lot of clients all around Sao Paulo, which basically meant I spent a lot of time in the car because the traffic was insane. But as I was traveling to these clients, I saw some fantastic Scrum implementations. I saw burn down charts. I saw da fantastic daily Scrums. Over and over again, I saw amazing stuff. But I, after the first day, I felt something was missing. I was like, hmm, people were talking about work and, you know, and sometimes they spoke in English to help me and or somebody was translating for me. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was interesting, but they were talking about work and I realized that they didn't have any personas on the walls. People were talking about the tasks that were outstanding on a sprint. They were talking about bringing up work to the product owner because he can go and see the customer and talk about it. The backlogs were full of tasks. Uh, everybody was talking about velocity. In fact, numbers of story points was on the board. And though I didn't attend any sprint reviews, I asked a lot of people whether customers were attending the sprint reviews. And what I heard was a lot of proxy customers were. And I didn't see now, this may have been unfortunate. I may not have asked the right questions, but I can't remember seeing a sprint goal. That's what I've seen over and over again. And in fact, what I see more and more in organizations, when I peel back the onion around Scrum, I see they have a work backlog. I see that the product owner really is more like a project manager managing that work backlog. I found that there's no sprint goal. I, I find particularly the, the smart teams have a very clear definition of ready gate to get into the sprint backlog. And that definition of ready ensures that their velocity isn't undermined by poorly defined stories or product backlog items entering the sprint. Every day they meet and they talk about how to get these things through the process. And honestly, the increment disappears at some point, but the, but the review doesn't talk about it being used by customers, it talks about the work. And retrospectives become velocity increasing meetings, which is great and I appreciate what people are doing and there's lots of reasons for it. So I'm not insulting anybody, but I feel that Scrum and the, Ag and the teams are being delivered a disservice, are, are having a, aren't necessarily fulfilling their potential. And really what they're doing probably is like water, the planning process is separate, work comes into the backlog outside of, of that sort of world. Um, and then they do scrum on the work and then stuff occasionally disappears off into the, into the process. Water, scrum fall. This was a term that I coined when I was an analyst at Forrester Research. Uh, which really described how Scrum was being used by all these organizations. Everybody was saying they were doing Scrum or doing Agile, but the reality was they were doing Agile in a very bound way. Now, don't get me wrong, ladies and gentlemen, the value that they got was they improved the way they work. They maybe did some cross-functionalness, meaning they worked together, they focused on certain things, they delivered a lot more work than they perhaps would have. However, did they deliver as much value? I don't know.
So why is it so important to reorient towards value, to step away from just doing work? Well, number one, it allows self-management to happen. So self-management was a term now in the Scrum Guide that clearly talks about the idea that a team is allowed to do anything necessary to deliver the increment of value, potentially useful increment of value, right? You know, and does anything it can. Now, if it runs in an environment where, you know, somebody, uh, there's people around them providing certain things, then they don't have to do as much as in an environment where they do have to do everything. When I was working at a startup before I joined scrum.org, we had one team at the start, they interviewed people, they brought people contractors on to help them. They did anything that was within constraints, anything that they could do to deliver the product, right? To deliver incremental change to the product. Now, as we grew, we started pulling some of those functions out of it. Now, to the day, to this day, I'm still not sure whether that was good or bad, but that's what we did. The other thing, so with, you can't do self-management unless you have a clear idea of the value that you're aspiring to, and also the constraints that you have to work within. Now, any good Scrum team tests those constraints. The ones that break, they carry on doing it. The ones that hold firm, they accept and they adapt around it. The other thing that's really important about focusing on value is that it doesn't matter how you do things. I'm not going to tell a team, how, you know, actually what the solution is. I'm going to tell you what the outcome I achieve want is. And, it, and then these really creative, amazing people will work it out. It creates a space for innovation. It also creates a clear motivation. Dan Pink, obviously, um, some of you may have watched the TED Talk that he delivered. It's a fantastic TED Talk talks about autonomy, mastery, so uh, autonomy, self-management, mastery, which is, which is about getting better at your craft and a pride in it, and purpose, purpose, that in extrinsic motivating enabler called purpose. It also, if you've got this purpose, you build a rela better relationship with the team, which ultimately, with the team and the customer, which ultimately leads to better outcomes. Value sets the scene. Teams that understand why they're there are a lot more successful than teams that just understand the work that they've been given. So what can you do around this to really reposition yourself to be more value-based? So if you're a leader, if you're a manager, if you're you know, sort of like you're sitting there, you've got your teams around you. And at the moment, you've had this annual port, uh, portfolio planning process, maybe using SAFE or some other approach, doesn't really matter. And you've got all this work that you've got. The first thing that I would do if I had the power to do it is I'd look at how that work and those teams relate to the customer and the value streams that they, they live in, the processes that you're supporting. And what I would try to do is maybe not now, but in the future, realign the funding model so we fund those value streams, which then the teams support. What we see in organizations that have become a little bit more customer centric and a little bit more value oriented is that the portfolio planning process, they've moved away from projects, they have these products or these services or whatever you want to call them that are aligned to customer and they fund those that then allows them to determine how much how much value to the business each of these are delivering and then they literally say well that means we can have five teams two teams one team one person and that allows them to really align those value streams to the teams they also start putting in metrics and measures, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, a set that we think are valuable, uh, called, um, that are really decide that are all about outcomes rather than work-based. So we, so we move away from percentage complete. We move away from velocity. We move away from story points left outstanding, you know, inventory as it were. And we move instead to the value that's being delivered 
And that means we at very least have to have a start having a conversation of what is the important measure for each of these things. All of this, though, comes in the context of an importance of vision and goals. So um, as we'll talk about in a moment, product goal was added to the, um, to the Scrum Guide. And what that provides us with is a mechanism to take that vision and to say, OK, out of that huge vision that we have, the first element that we're working on, the first goal is this. And you take that goal, you then break it down into increments, which become sprints, and you incrementally move that. You reevaluate those that goal over and over again, every sprint or every increment to ensure that you're making progress against this. And then the teams that are doing that are aligned and connect to the customer. And then that basically encourages an environment where we have full transparency. If you can't explain why you're doing something to a customer or to a series of stakeholders in terms of the business, then maybe that's not as valuable. It might be, and we might have to work on it together to really understand the importance of stuff. But I, I would argue that uh, that's, a, that's a bit of a hint. If you're a team member, that means you need to think about it in terms of the refining the backlog in terms of the why. So if you're presented with a series of stories that are very tactical, step, spend some time with a product owner or, other, or SMEs and actually start thinking about how those very practical stories fit into the value that the customer is going to get from that. Now, that allows you to start possibly reframing the backlog so it actually starts thinking about the why. Also, think about the customer and frame those stories and that work in the context of that customer. One of the things that I've done since I've been uh, leading Scrum.org is I, I like at building bridges. So you may have seen our work in Kanban, you may have seen some stuff we've been doing in product agile product management, but one bridge I'm particularly excited about is our professional Scrum with UX, user experience, where we worked with the lean UX guys, Jeff and Josh, and actually started thinking about how we could better bring the customer in experimentation, hypothesis development into the process. Now, that meant I learned a lot. I went back from the class when I attended, um, it was um, uh, Jeff's class, actually. I attended his class and um, I found instantly that my backlog wasn't written correctly. In fact, I didn't even know the, who the customer was for a lot of the things in it. So I sat down with the team and spent a ridiculously large amount of time, it felt, recrafting what we were going to do in that context. That then allowed me, you know, some of our customers are trainers, some of our customers are end learners. It allowed us to then start surfacing this, either in sprint reviews or some other reviews, to those. It made it easier. We were talking a similar language. And the other thing that I reminded me of was the fact we didn't have to wait for the review to get that feedback. We could actually engage throughout. And that, that engagement isn't gated by the product owner. The product owner is responsible for ensuring that we're delivering the right order of value, the priorities, right? Obviously, that, that priority is influenced by lots of factors, and the product owner will take all those into consideration, stakeholders, customers, the actual techno technology, the risks, et cetera, and bring that and make those decisions. They're not responsible for providing a gate between you and the customer. And that really means that as a team member, I need to become more familiar with the customer. So we've often talked about T-shaped, pie-shaped, uh, comb-shaped people in this world of generalism. Well, what the cross bit at the top is a general set of skills, but it also really talks about the fact that everybody needs to be building a better understanding of the customer. And then that empowers us to at least ask that question, how does the work I'm doing, how does the work that I'm doing now help X, that customer, that persona? 
If we start moving to that way of working, then we're in a really good position to really challenge the value proposition of the work that we're doing. And at the end of the day, if we can't answer some of these questions, then perhaps that is illustrative that something may have broken. But hang on a minute, I know what you're saying. You're saying, Dave, that sounds great on paper. That's just you doing the old Peaky Blinders English thing, you know, apples and pears, all right, geezer. And yeah, of course you'd say that, but we have legacy systems not allied to customers and outcomes. My bonus is managed against a series of KPIs that were decided at the start of the year by some random person who I don't really know. I wanna, I, I, I'm not really interested in the business. I care deeply about, you know, maybe I'm in marketing, maybe I'm in technology, maybe I'm in AI, maybe I'm in, you know, that's what I care about. Um, and can't we just trust the people around us to tell us what we need to do? Why do we have to, what, surely if they wrote good requirements, we could deliver great product, right? Isn't this all just more messy and inefficient? Everybody talking to the customer, everybody getting involved in the problem, everybody having an opinion. The last thing we want, gosh, it'll be like the House of Representatives or in the case of the House of the Parliament in the UK. And, and it means probably I have to ask about things I don't understand, like, you know, the, yeah, I don't know, FDA for pharmaceutical or banking systems or and the customer just wants this system. They don't want to talk to us for its development. Yes, that's right. You, all of those things are true, but this doesn't have to be a revolution. And yes, your legacy systems are out of whack. And yes, you, you know, you perhaps want to concentrate on technology and, and that's, but you need to make a choice then. And yes, the customer doesn't necessarily have the same appreciation of the fact that we're all in the technology business or all in the outcome business. They're too busy with the day to day. But you're smart people. You can fix these things. I know that you're capable of doing that and you will be successful doing it. Even if you just start thinking about your work, step back from the details and start elevating the context. Start mentioning the customer. I work with a scrum master, his name's Steve Porter. He's annoying a lot of the time because he's an awesome person. He's incredibly smart, but he's annoying because he asks this, hey, hey, what are we trying to do here? I was like, oh, blah, 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 blah. What's the smallest thing we can do to help the customer just a little bit? And he refri I'm a product owner and he makes me step back from the work that I'm doing and really think about that. And then what he's been helping me do is slowly move our team to be more value oriented every day. Now, we're not the only people doing this. You may have heard of the Amazon working backward method, which sounds sort of very, very odd, doesn't it? But the, the, the backward working method means instead of creating the backlog, going, building the roadmap, blah, 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 what you do is you actually start with the customer. And if you were building a press release to tell the customer, how, what the thing is you're doing, how, what would that look? Then you say, well, hang on, does this make any sense? Then start talking to stakeholders about the impact and then build that high level roadmap, then to break that down into goals, which is missing from here because it wasn't in the scrum guide then, and then create the backlog, assign the tasks and start working on it. So that's what Amazon does every day. Now, I don't know about you, but Amazon seems to come to my house more than, more than anybody else. I've seen the Amazon driver a lot more than my family over the last year. I don't know about you. Um, so maybe they're doing something right. The last thing I just want to finish with is measurement. 
to really move to a value-based oriented organization, you need to really think about the measures that you're delivering. Those measures really provide us with a direction, like a compass for where True North is, et cetera. Now we've been experimenting with something called EBM, evidence-based management. And we've been experimenting with a, a series of practices and a series of measures that can help most teams, most product-oriented teams deliver value more succinctly and ask the right questions of what's important. And broadly, that breaks down into four sort of areas. It breaks down on the market side of current value and unreals value. On the capability side, ability to innovate, time to market. We started, we often start with current value and time to market. So what's the value that, you know, that we have today? And then incrementally, where do we want it to get to? That's the unrealized value. And then how every time we deliver something, hopefully it's moved the needle in some way. And that value could be as much as a survey of customers. It could be real money. It could be people on the site. It could be how many people are using something. It could be anything. We have to define that. And the EBM guide provides us some advice around that. I really like the, also the, the concept of ability to innovate. This idea that innovation, what percentage of those changes, what percentage of that increment is new stuff versus fixing old stuff, making things work for compliance stuff and the like. If we start measuring these four things or metrics for these four categories, we'll start really getting an idea of the value that we're trying to achieve and how we're doing against that. If you do that, I think you can start helping your team get better. At the end of the day, and it pains me to say this, Scrum and Agile isn't the end goal ever. Value in an uncertain, turbulent, ever-changing world is the goal. If we can manage to do that, and if we use Scrum and Agile to do that, which I think we have to, the world will be a better place. So that's, I'll leave that up rather than the LinkedIn stuff. That's what I wanted to talk about today. Hopefully you found this interesting. I've tried to talk a little bit slower for translation. Um, it's completely anti my, <laughs> my natural way of talking. So, and also it's reduced the number of jokes that I provided, which is, which is probably good, but um, um, I'm a little bit of a dad joker, you know, like the worst jokes. My kids look at me and go, really dad, is that it? So um, that's what I wanted to talk about today. Hopefully we have the time for some questions, um, or if not, you get the time back. Uh, so thank you for your time and thank you for, for listening. Have we got some questions? Yes, I think we do. I will, jo I will ask uh, Larissa and Benny to join us back here and they can provide us some questions. Hello, ladies. Olá, Lari. Olá, Dani. Olá. Temos algumas Olá. perguntas para o Dave? Olá, temos. A primeira pergunta que a gente tem aqui é com essa ressignificação do time, falando com o cliente, como se inova na mesma linha o papel do Scrum Master e como evitar conflitos com o PO devido a dificuldades dele em aceitar a nova real? Ok, então, so, uh, a primeira pergunta seria com esse novo assignment para os times de olhar para o valor, certo? Como podemos evitar o conflito entre os Scrum Masters, o novo papel e o produto de honor? Como podemos manejar o conflito de interesse lá? Ok, é interessante que você acha que há um conflito. O trabalho de conflito de produto é assegurar the priorities of the backlog, the order of the, the stuff, the value that we're delivering is with all of the stakeholders and all of the compromises that they have to make is the best it can be based in the circumstance. The Scrum Master's job is to ensure that transparency happens, that, that Scrum is being enacted. And they do that by serving the product owner, by helping them to deliver the most uh, 
the most value, meaning that they communicated effectively, they, they described the goals effectively. The team, so that they're using the Scrum events and all of those things to ensure transparency, so inspecting and adapting and making progress uh, on, a, on a hopefully a daily basis and not breaking any of the ideas of Scrum. And then the organization to ensure that the, t the, the Scrum team, which is the product owner, the Scrum master, and the developers are actually got an environment that allows that success. So in real terms, what that means is the Scrum master's job is to make things transparent, to ask the questions. The product owner's job is to make the decisions and help the team really understand to connect the team up with the right customers, the right stakeholders to, to actually deliver that most value. The reality is it's a partnership. One person is very much focused on let's make progress facilitating, um, uh, mentoring, coaching, helping deal with some of the challenges of, of working in this way. The other person is really saying, this is where we need to go. This is the mission that we're on. And this is the first chunk of work that we're going to do to deliver against that mission. Let's make sure, or the, you see, I even do it myself, chunk of value that we're going to do to deliver on that mission. Let's, and, and let's measure that as we go. So you've got this really nice synergy, this separation of concern. Now, interestingly, the Scrum Guide now doesn't describe them as roles. It describes them as accountabilities. So it's possible that it's a product manager that's got the product owner accountabilities or some other job title. But the idea is that you've got this separation of control between this person that cares very deeply about the discipline of the process, the, how it's working, making sure all the right things happen, and somebody that cares very much the direction that you're going. And um, it's a very natural separation. I'm a product owner, right? That's kind of my thing, my skills. I have to work with teams, but I'm not necessarily good at making sure that I'm communicating effectively, that the team's communicating back to me the right information. That Scrum Master really acts as that, as that uh, helping hand or that guide um, to do that. Ho hopefully that answers the question. Does that make sense? A gente tem mais alguma pergunta, Dani? Tem mais uma aqui. Awesome. Essa já está direto em inglês. <laughs> so this is one is already for you, David. It's already in English. Could oh. you give some examples of metrics of uh, unrealized value? Uh, well, um, unrealized value really is talking about the market. So it could be the how many people are using a website. It could be how many people are using a, a series of features or moving through the process. You know, it could be something uh, as simple as, you know, if, if, it's, if it's NPS, if that's your current value is being measured in net promoter score or one of the current values that you're really interested in, then obviously there's a very simple, you, you, you know what the maximum NPS are. And you also can benchmark that NPS against other, other industries or other, other systems that are similar. It's, um, it's, it's really what is the opportunity that we're really going after? Because you know, we might say that we're delivering this much current value. So, so when Ken, so let me give you an example that's really close to home and it's horrible by the way. So Ken Schwaber uses this to help me, right? To make some decisions. So he says, there's a, according to McKinsey, there's a billion knowledge workers in the world, 1 billion uh, in 20, sorry, in 2025, there'll be a billion. At the moment, there's this many, right? And he says, okay, so why is only 12 million people coming to your website? So my current value is 12 million. My unrealized value is a billion. Well, not quite, it's like 800 and something million now. And there's a big difference, which is really annoying because I was really excited about the million people that were coming to my website every month. But he really did have a crack at me. I'm like, oh dear. Now, so he says, and how much, how many are we changing this website? What's the, you know, what, are, how frequently are we changing some stuff? And I, we talked about, and how much new content's being delivered? So that's the ability to innovate, right? How much new stuff's being delivered as opposed to fixing things, adding new classes, whatever, you know, the boring stuff, right? 
that was really interesting. Just by stepping back for a moment, it put context to, in our case, the, just the scrum.org website and really providing us with a foundation to actually do some, well, what do we want to achieve? Do we, what, it, we can't just say we want a billion people. How many of those billion people are really our unrealized value? Okay, how many people uh, have taken PSM1 and we really would like them to be doing more further learning? How many of those people come back to our website? Oh, that's an unrealized value. How many could and how many are? Oh, we've got a delta. So really it's just asking the right questions. It doesn't necessarily have to be right, but it could help at least have those conversations with your stakeholders and potentially uncover exactly what they think the opportunity is as opposed to what you think it is. That's a great question, by the way. Thank you for asking it. Okay. O Fábio Rodrigues está perguntando. Uh, eu vou tentar traduzir a pergunta aqui. Eu entendi que é necessário a gente uh, criar o accountability, né? Esse senso de responsabilidade entre os times, dev teams e, e customers. Uh, se eles precisam desse accountability, né? Se eles tiverem esse accountability, vai uh, promover uma proatividade no formato em que eles se organizacionam, né? que eles, que eles uh, se, se comunicam e mais empatia com os problemas do negócio é, e vai promover uma melhora. Né? E no final do dia, né? no final das contas, uh, eles vão entregar mais valor, vão entregar mais funcionalidades porque eles entendem melhor do negócio. Né? Accountability, né? Esse, essa ideia por trás de, de, de ter a, a, o domínio, é, é o que pode promover isso. Você concorda com isso, David? Tem algum comentário? Uh, I, yeah, so I read that. I look here. I was like, what is he going on about? And then I looked. So it's great. Hey, so um, I believe that's Fabio. Fabio, you hit the nail on the head. And in fact, you'll notice, I didn't talk about this and I really should. I'm going to update the slides to be more about this because you made me think of something. Thank you for that. That's why inspection and adaption eh, is. But um, the Scrum Guide, the last version of the Scrum Guide, it, it added a few things that were very focused on, on this. One was the product goal, which is the commitment to the product backlog. The other thing was the three um, uh, the three sections of sprint planning, one, the first section being about value. The other thing that it did, which was more subtle, was it really did tighten up the idea of what a scrum team does. Now, a, a great example, there's a petrochemical company that, that we work with a lot, big petrochemical company, and, uh, and they have lots of scrum teams. And uh, the head of the whole program I, I spend some time with occasionally, I learn, like using Scrum on oil rigs, how cool is that? They use it for the safety critical issues in Angola. Uh, it, it is an oil rig system there, it's really cool. But anyway, I digress. But they, the, we have these conversations and this, this leader at, B, at a large petrochemical company, I'm not gonna say their name, said to me, my Scrum masters don't wanna be held accountable for the increment and the value it delivers. And the development team says it's not their responsibility, they're measured by the definition of done. And the only person responsible for value is the product owner. Is that true? And I was like, no, 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 everybody cares about delivering value. But then I found the previous version of the Scrum Guide didn't say that. So you'll notice that the development team is no longer in the Scrum Guide. Everybody, the scrum team is ultimately accountable for a valuable increment, you know, on that incremental sprint model, incrementally delivering potentially useful value to customers, right? The updating the product with the changes. So that means that ultimately everybody is accountable. So um, Fabio, you nail on the head, getting everybody to feel accountable and responsible for the value. Now, that means that you have to connect people up to the whole value stream. That means you to make these things transparent. That means everybody has to be continuously in, in sight of the goal. That means you have to understand. Now, if you go to Tesla, for instance, everybody cares about the mission they're on. 
everybody. They're passionate about that mission and they understand how they're contributing to that mission. And they, that's the reason why they sleep on the blooming factory floor. That's the reason why they get up in the morning. That's the reason why they get paid less money than other people. But that's another story. The point is they care deeply about that mission because they want to disrupt that industry and change the world. Now, imagine if you did that in, in insurance, in pharmaceutical, in healthcare, in government, in manufacturing, in general consumer product packaged goods. If you did that, it would be amazing. Remember, it isn't about being, to use a football analogy, the best defender or the best goalie. I, I love it that goalkeepers get rewarded on clean sheets. Who cares? I would rather win than draw. You know what I mean? So let's win. So, um, so the short answer is yeah, love it. Fabio, you've completely nailed it. Awesome, awesome, some good content. Renatinho, a gente estourou nosso tempo. Já estouramos o tempo. Eu descobri tempo. que 45 minutos é muito pouco tempo. A gente vai ter que fazer os próximos com um time box maior, viu? Guess, guess what, Dave? We have We've a, hit the time box. Time already. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no problem. I get it. But remember, this. I, I seem to talk in Brazil all the time now. I, I can't wait for COVID to be over so I can come back and visit and put on another 20 pounds. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Agile B. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming to this session. You know, I, my heart is with you with the challenges in, in Brazil at the moment uh, with respect to COVID. I hope you all get better soon and we all get better as a world so we can start coming together again a little bit easier physically. So thank you for inviting me. If you need anything, email me, text me, LinkedIn me, whatever those, or tweet me, I guess. Um, we're here to help you and I love talking about this stuff. Have fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you once again, bye-bye, Davey. Ciao, ciao. Bye.